I think one of the newest hybrids that has the longest name is Rocco Bociana Vici, cross Rocco Bociana, cross Rocco Fusca Spectabilis Tresmariensis. That's a lot of stuff. That is a lot of stuff. And you wouldn't be able to say that 10 times fast because you wouldn't even be able to remember it. <laughs> So Dominic, describe a little bit where we are here in Brooklyn. Um, we are in my backyard. Um, this is my nursery, Redleaf Exotics. I collect and grow carnivorous plants called Nepenthes. And yeah, this is my paradise and my favorite place on earth. And I'm glad I'm getting a chance to see you here because it sounds like you're going to move your Nepenthes to warmer climates soon. Yes, I um, plan on moving to Tennessee. My business has expanded a lot faster than I thought and the plants have outgrown the space so I need a sunnier, warmer, more, um, just a better environment for the plants. So for people who don't know what Nepenthes are, or maybe only seen like one little species in their, their store, what is Nepenthes? So Nepenthes are carnivorous plants that come from Indonesia. They have evolved these modified leaves that capture insects and digest them and they kind of look like a beautiful hand-painted vase. Yeah, they're just spectacular. You used to be an orchid guy before your Nepenthes? I used to be an orchid collector, yes. But you got rid of many of your orchids. Completely did away, kind of, with them. <laughs> They'll always have uh, be an addiction. But when I was a little kid, I loved, saw Venus flytraps. Um, this was when I was collecting orchids, around 13. And amongst them was a little Nepenthes plant, and it looked different, so I brought it home. I always Googled everything that I brought home, and when I Googled Nepenthes and saw the array of varieties and stuff, orchids started disappearing, and I just started ordering more and more of them, and I've been addicted ever since, around 13 years old. People have been for you know, a couple centuries now fascinated with the idea of a carnivorous plant, like something that could actually physically eat an invertebrate or even a, a vertebrate in yeah. some cases, I've, I've heard. Um, you know, what, what else about Nepenthes that makes it like really uh, like stunning? I mean, there's just, you'll see, there's just nothing that really looks like them or even as far as how highly evolved they are compared to other carnivorous plants, there's just nothing that I've ever seen or come in contact with in my life that compares to Nepenthes plant. Everything from the size of the traps, the colors, how big they get, the enzymes they produce, there's so many things that just endless fascination with them. <laughs> and, and you mentioned that the it's a modified leaves, which yes. is really phenomenal, because here it is like this leaf that's attracting, trapping, and literally, you know, eating. Uh, you know, some type of animal or insect or whatever it might be. I know you've gone to see some of these things in the wild. I'd love to hear where you've gone in the wild, how these things evolved, and why they may have evolved that way. So I traveled to the island of Borneo in Indonesia to see them, and I went to two specific mountain ranges, uh, Mount Tresmati and Mount Kinabalu, and that's two of the most highly populated areas for the plants. And these plants just grow all over the tops but still very rare compared to most plants as it's only two mountain ranges. And they've evolved to lure and capture insects because the soils they grow in are so poor in nutrients that they've kind of outsmarted other plants and they found other ways to get the nutrients that they need. What are some of the evolutionary structures of these plants? Because I know that there's some dimorphism that happens. Mm -hmm. There's like fragrance that happens. Like what's the, what's the kind of range? And when we go into your greenhouse, maybe you could kind of point out some of the, the interesting structures as well. Well, some of the plants produce what are called lower pitchers, which are more bulky and heavy. And they catch things like anywhere from ants, termites, to larger things like mammals, um, small mice. And then the upper pitchers that grow up into the trees, they're more delicate, lighter in color, and they produce a tendril that wraps around and secures the plant. They even can produce different fragrances from pitcher to pitcher mm. because the prey up in the trees are different than what's on the ground. I mean, they, <laughs> they have to have some kind of mind of their own. It really is fascinating. There is one also that you showed me when we were with uh, Mick the other day that, you, that acts as like a little bit like a toilet bowl. So that is Nepenthes lowii, which I'll show you. And it has evolved this symbiotic relationship with a mouse-like creature called a shrew. And 
almost 100% of the nutrients this plant intakes is from the shrew. And the exudate, which is a sugary substance under the lid that it eats, um, has a laxative in it and it causes the shrew to poop or defecate in the pitcher and it will absorb the nutrients and it's amazing that the plant realizes that that creature is around and they've evolved together over millions of years. I mean that just goes to show you that like when you remove something from the ecosystem how it could be detriment to another yeah. another um, piece within the ecosystem especially which brings me to the uh, question because I know you had posted this the other day in regards to habitat destruction and can you give me an idea, because you had mentioned a lot of these are concentrated in Indonesia, can you just give me an idea of some of the pressures that Nepenthes are facing uh, you know, in the wild? One of the biggest things that is going on with Nepenthes and their habitat now is palm oil plantations. When I visited, I mean, you can drive hours and there's nothing but palm oil plantations and it's really sad. Um, so deforestation is definitely number one. I'd say the second in line is probably climate change. Um, because some of them come from such high altitudes, um, the winds are becoming a little more dry, the humidity is going low, and these plants need that moisture to survive. Mm -hmm. So climate change is a huge one. And then another big one is actually wild collection. Um, as the hobby grows and people get hungrier for the plants, um, you know, these people that live in these small countries and stuff, their way of making money is to come and offer plants for cheap yeah. and illegally ship them. I've been offered many illegal plants and it's sad. Um, but yeah, those are probably the three biggest things that affect the plants in the wild. And as a collector, what do you think your role is uh, in kind of thinking about like, oh, should I take this plant or not? Like say it was like the last species of its kind. And I know botanical gardens deal with this too, because they're like, well, should I turn it away or should I take it? Because at least if we take it, we might have that ability to be able to grow and grow ex situ outside of its own country and habitat. But what role do collectors as well as growers play in this? It's a very intricate puzzle, but um, I'd say one of the biggest things that's going on with a lot of plants today is tissue culture, you know, cloning and multiplying these plants in large quantities so people don't have to get them from the wild. Seed grown plants are amazing. There are a lot of people that still collect wild seed. And honestly, I think it's a lot better than going and ripping these plants that are thousands of years old out of the wild and disturbing them. Um, for me, I like to just share my passion and a lot of people love the species, but I like to get people involved with the hybrids um, and maybe take the pressure off the species in the wild. So there are a few um, natural hybrids, but the thing with Nepenthes is they're either a male or a female. Mm -hmm. So the chances of getting both in bloom at the same time is a little tough. So definitely a lot more slow in reproducing than other plants. That's another you know point that you make on the conservation front that if you're if you have like a population of say like 50 and all of a sudden you remove some plants without knowing it's a male or female, you might end up with all just males left and then that would be the death knell for that species too. Yes. So how many species in general do you know? If, uh, has there been, been a count so far? Yes. So tiny backstory, when I started there were about 70 or 80 species known and now there are around 171 and a few around there that aren't described. And every year, I mean, even this year alone, they found a new species that's undescribed. So it's really amazing to see that there's this terrain of things that we still don't know about. Um, so all the more reason to protect it. And you mentioned some of them up on mountain ranges as well. So I'm assuming there's a lot of places that people haven't gotten to yet. And maybe some, sometimes those mountains are what protect them from human hands. Yeah, especially one of the bigger places that they're finding more is actually New Guinea. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever seen some of the mountains there, they're just like sheer razor blades coming up, almost impossible to get into. But that's where a lot of the latest discoveries are happening. Wow. And what other places? I mean, New Guinea is pretty close to Indonesia itself. But like, what are some of the other places that uh, have Nepenthes kind of shown up? Um, the northern tip of Australia, the Philippines, Sumatra, um, Singapore, you can go over to Madagascar, mm -hmm. um, 
Where else? All in the Indonesia and yeah. outerlying areas yeah. around Fantastic. there. When you bring your Nepenthes in, are you getting them from um, other fellow growers or how, how are you kind of acquiring your Nepenthes without giving your secret sauce away? So <laughs> I always love this story. <laughs> My friends and the best Nepenthes nursery in the world, Exotica Plants in Australia, they are at the leading edge of hybridization, if you will. Um, they've just created so many fancy hybrids that it's just taken Nepenthes in the world to a new level. And um, I get all of my plants from them. Um, I'm a Pisces, they're Pisces, and I like to think that it's a little magical Pisces family, but I get all my plants from them. I import them from Australia. How long does it take to, in general, to grow from a Nepenthes from seed to a place that you could actually sell it? Um, so when I pollinate the seed, the plants, that usually takes around six months to get the seed. And then you plant the seed and that can take anywhere from two to three years to get something that's sellable. Wow. I like to get my plants a little larger, so maybe yeah. even a little longer. Oh, wow. That is, that is a commitment right there. It's a long time. Yeah. Um, I like to do cuttings and separate basil shoots off the bottom. That's a, a lot quicker, mm -hmm. but they don't produce them every day. So still slow. <laughs> and what are some of your maybe like top three to five favorites? And I know you have to God. choose between like but I, favorite I children. <laughs> <laughs> it's good we're saying it out here and not in there. Okay, um, good. They can't hear. <laughs> my number one favorite species, and it's my company logo, is Nepenthes vicii. And I'll show you a few of those when we go inside. Um, my favorite man-made hybrid from my friends in Australia is Lowei Crash Truncata Giant, which you'll see in there, amazing and gigantic. Um, and then the names just get crazier. One of my top favorite hybrids is Rocco Fusca Spectabilis Trismatiensis. <laughs> love rambling the names. Um, I love when you ramble them. <laughs> another beautiful one I'll show you is Truncata Vici Maximus Spectabilis. Those yeah. are probably the top four or five. Love those plants. You make yeah. people want to speak Latin. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, me and my friends sometimes like to go around the greenhouse and the game is like, what's this? What's this? What this? And they just get a kick out of all the names that come out of my mouth. Everyone always complains like, oh, my Nepenthes, I don't know how to take care of it. The, the pitchers fall off. Um, and I notice you have all of yours in a greenhouse, not indoors. So yeah. can you give people some tips about growing Nepenthes in their home? Yes, um, I actually grew indoors for many years and there's just a couple things like a pet that if you provide, they'll be so rewarding. Number one is humidity. The pl these plants come from such humid environments, even a humidifier, if you can get one at your local pharmacy, they love that. Um, and bright light. A lot of people want to grow them in windows and depending on where you live, that can work. But I always suggest a grow light, T5 being the best. So indoors, you can feed them maybe once a week or more, like put a cricket or something inside the uh, pitchers. Um, a common practice that some indoor growers do is fish pellets. Mm. They seem to work really well for the plants. Mm. Do, do people ever throw in like bits of meat or anything? People like to think that that's a good idea, but it's actually not good because the meat is not alive and living with bacteria and stuff in it. It actually causes more harm than good. Mm. And you'll probably notice your pitchers will start to rot or decay. Mm. So live food only, unless it's like fish pellets. Word to the wise that that's the stuff that we eat. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> your pitcher right? doesn't like it. <laughs> exactly, seriously. And I can't wait to go in there yet again to see some of your Nepenthes and to share your knowledge and passion to this great community. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's actually kind of a dream that you're here doing this because I follow you and really excited that you're here doing this with me. Be sure to stay tuned next week because we'll be getting a full tour of the wild world of Nepenthes with Dominic from Red Leaf Exotics. If you're loving what you're seeing every week, then be sure to subscribe to the channel and follow along on Instagram at Homestead Brooklyn and at homesteadbrooklyn.com. See you next time.